Renee? Yes? Are you a big leftover fan? Oh my god, I love leftovers. You do? Constantly, yeah. There's nothing better. My favorite, I would have to say, are whenever I get takeout or I make my own Vietnamese-style rice noodles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I make sure, like, great restraint, I make sure there's some leftover. And then I'll sizzle them up in a skillet, cast iron the next morning. Okay. Till they're crispy at the edges. Mm -hmm. And kind of a little chewy, gooey, just a Mm -hmm. little bit of that kind of like tapioca starch, okay. rice noodle thing. Yeah. And then I'll crack a couple eggs on top. Okay, nice. That's one of my favorites. Eggs on top of almost anything to me makes it breakfast or supper for that matter. Mm-hmm. There's just no end to what you can do with leftovers. Mm-hmm. What about you? Well, you have to understand when I eat, there's no leftovers. So <laughs> there's, that's a big issue. <laughs> there's you mean no you left- never have like like a quarter cup of cooked rice left over and, you know, half a piece of halibut? Well, you know, if it's on the plate at the end of the meal, the one and I are like, well, let's just eat it now. But um, when we do have leftovers, I think we make that terrible mistake that everyone does, which is, well, if you had roast chicken last night, have roast chicken tonight. Mm. And if, if there's some left over, have roast chicken the night after that. And so I get bored and so I want something different. So I'm not, if we have them, except Thanksgiving, I can eat Thanksgiving leftovers Day after day after day. The same exact meal, day after day. I love it. Interesting. What about you, Adam? You a big leftover fan? Well, I mean, what's not to love about leftovers when you think you get to eat faster and there's less dishes? Right? Less dishes. I love (laughs) that. There you go. Smart man. Smart man. Well, today's guest knows all about leftovers, and he's even written a book about it. It's titled, Sam the Cooking Guy. Recipes with Intentional Leftovers, and he'll explain exactly what intentional leftovers is, are, is, whatever, are. Are. Sam Zion (laughs) is an author, restaurateur, and YouTube sensation with 2.4 million subscribers. But I do think that my 792 subscribers could still stand up to his. I do. Uh, I don't know about that. (laughs) I'm Renee Shetler, Editor-in-Chief of the website Leet's Culinaria. And I'm David Leet, its founder. And this is Talking With My Mouthful, a podcast devoted to all things food, the people who make it, and the stories that make the people. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thanks for being here, Sam. Thanks, guys. I'm so happy to be here. All right, so let's just start out and shoot from the hip as you always shoot from the hip. Go for it. You didn't go to cooking school. No. You didn't have any media training, yet you no. are a YouTube superstar, basically. I mean, there's Justin Bieber, and then there's you. Right? <laughs> there might be a couple other people in between <laughs> us, David. <laughs> just, a, just a couple. It's close. Well, it's close. I mean, do you know that you have 2.4 million subscribers, which I'm sure you do know, yeah. but you probably may not that, know, David. is that that's four times the population of Newfoundland and Labrador together. Oh, that did I did that? not know, actually. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so, David's great at that kind of information. <laughs> but thank you for the the Canadian population references. I'm from Vancouver, and I appreciate exactly. It. Yeah. I did that specifically for you. I so briefly, you tell us how yeah. did you get from there to here? All right, I grew up never having any idea what I wanted to do, and it, mm-hmm. so many mm-hmm. people are in that position. I found myself graduating high school, no clue. I went to a college, no clue. I had three older brothers. My second oldest brother was in advertising, and I thought, that, that seems reasonable. I'll just follow what he's done. So mm-hmm. he uh, lived in Toronto. I moved to Toronto. He worked for an agency, started his own. I worked for an agency. And, you know, look, just following somebody else's example is not, <laughs> we work, what, with 30-ish percent of our lives. This is yes, something yeah, that we do. should be really enjoying. And mm-hmm. we ended up in Phoenix, specifically Tempe, where uh, lovely Renee is. And we, mm-hmm. uh, one of his clients, my brother's agency's clients, was a place called Penguin's Frozen Yogurt. We bought into the franchise, my wife, Kelly, myself, my dad, and my brother. Kelly and I ran it for about a year and a half until the guy that had the franchise rights for Tucson had to have Phoenix rights so badly. He bought it from us. Nobody really made any money, didn't know what to do. So I did what a lot of people do when they don't know what to do. I went into real estate. And I was in real of estate course, for five exactly. years, of course. It's a, it's exactly. a look, it's an honorable profession 
anything is honorable yep. as long as you like it. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it. Amen. I actually, we moved from uh, Phoenix to San Diego because we had some family here. Went into real estate mm-hmm. in San Diego, didn't like it. Always said, I believe this will lead me to something. I just didn't know what. Sold a okay. house to a guy once who started a biotech company and he called me up to help him find the facility space. And in the middle of that transaction, he looked at me one day and he goes, you know what, we get along so well. Why don't you come work for me at the biotech company? And I said, I don't know anything like that. He goes, no, but you could be the facilities manager, you know, building and real estate and stuff like that. So I said, thank you. Yes, I'm happy to go. And I went and seven years later, I was so miserable so yeah. miserable. I think I think if you've watched uh, my, you. our YouTube channel, even for five mm. minutes, I'm a pretty happy guy. I wake up yeah. happy. Yeah. I go to sleep happy. My social life is happy. My family life is happy. But in my biotech days, I would drive 30 minutes north of San Diego to Carlsbad. And as I went north in the morning, my mood would go south. And every day for the last year that I worked there, I drove into the parking lot and I said, not this effing place again. And that is about as sad as it gets. So I find myself one day uh, sitting at my coffee table in San Diego with the San Diego Union Tribune Sunday help wanted general section. And I start with my pointer finger in the A's. I'm literally going down the columns, hoping to find some inspiration imagining that as my finger touches hotel night auditor or or janitor or accountant <laughs> the the hand of god will push me i'll get a <laughs> an electric charge a and I'll go, that's it yeah. this is what it's supposed to be and i'm going to tell you something yeah. God doesn't work like that. It certainly didn't, didn't, talk, didn't, didn't work like that, that for me, right? <laughs> so I'm now sitting in my real in my uh, biotech office one day and I'm going through it. Really I was trying to put myself into some pre-existing job. It's round peg square hole kind of thinking. And I went, "Wait a minute, I'm mm-hmm. doing this wrong. What if somebody came in my door right now and said, "You can go do anything you want. What would that be? No mm-hmm. regard for family or money. What do you want to do? Just answer that question." And instantly the answer was, I wanted to go back to Tokyo where I'd been two years before. Mm -hmm. So I'm a fairly practical guy. That moment I started figuring out how could I get myself back to Tokyo because I fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. I could become a flight attendant or a pilot, but I don't like people that much that I want to be abused for 14 hours on a flight from San Diego to Tokyo. I see how people treat flight attendants, and it's horrible. Right. Um, I didn't. I can't. I'm lousy at math. I probably couldn't have been a pilot. I could teach English as a second language because I'm Canadian, and I do believe I speak the Queen's English. But you know, coming home and saying to my wife and family, "We're moving to Tokyo. We're going to live in 14 square feet. We'll sleep standing up. Lying down's overrated. Let's go." That wasn't going to work. And somewhere in the the next following half an hour, well, wait a minute. What if I did like a travel show? Not Hmm. quite the opposite of Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, which only people of a certain age will know. But maybe I could show people how to go to a place that they thought was complicated and it wouldn't be for them. So I called a little crew. uh, I quit my job. Came home, told my wife, my wife, before Kelly. Before shooting the pilot, before right? Before shooting the pilot, yes. I, I, my wife was, this is her response. Honey, I think that's an excellent idea and you should do it. Kelly now will tell you. She thought it was the worst idea on the planet, but she knew how miserable I was. And she knew if something yeah. drastic didn't happen in my life, I wouldn't right. make a change. Yeah. And that is the amazing person behind the person that gets the light shined on them. Mm-hmm. So- Without her suggestion, her push, I wouldn't have done it, but I did. I quit the job. I pulled the crew together. We got ready to go shoot some demo stuff in Tokyo and Hong Kong, and 9-11 happened. Hmm. Mm. And when I tell the story, I always say, that day changed thousands of other people's lives much, much more significantly than it changed mine, but my world still Mm -hmm. changed. I couldn't go back to the biotech company. I couldn't travel. Nobody was buying a travel show, especially from somebody that had barely traveled and had right. no television experience. So I sat at home. Kelly would go to work in the week, the week, the week, just literally the week and a half following 9-11 and say, what are you going to do, sweetheart? And I go, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. Flipping channels one morning, no job to go to. 
I came across what I say is the worst cooking segment I've ever seen on TV. A fancy chef in a local TV studio in San Diego making butternut squash soup. He was using creme fraiche. The, the anchors mm -hmm. had their dopey aprons on with the station number on it. They didn't mm -hmm. know what creme fraiche was. They couldn't pronounce it. There was this one long, horribly boring shot straight into the pot of over 30 seconds of just stirring. They don't know how to eat <laughs> food at a local TV station. Right. And this guy's job, he could probably kick my ass all over a kitchen then and potentially now. But this guy's job mm -hmm. was to do one thing, make something look beautiful that people at home would go, oh, my God, I want that. Let's go to the restaurant. And I thought, mm -hmm. listening to the complicated recipe and what was going on, I thought, what if somebody just cooked on TV and instead of saying, let's go there, they went, oh, my God, that looks delicious, but it also looks easy. I think I could make that. My wife comes right. home from work. I say, I've got it. She goes, you got what? I go, I know what I'm going to do. I go, not to travel, but cooking, simple stuff. And she goes, I think it's a great idea. There she is again with this encouragement. <laughs> right. She goes, just one thing. I go, why? She goes, you actually can't cook. I go, well, see, here's the genius part of this. I will make things so easy that anybody watching can also make them. I'll sort of be my own weakest link. Mm -hmm. Well, that was it. I shot a pilot. I sent it out. I got picked up by a local San Diego TV station to do two segments a week, a Monday and a Friday, a 90-second cooking segment. They would come to my house. Yeah. They would shoot. They would edit it down. It would air. And they started to become popular. And I started to learn how to cook. The first thing <laughs> wow. I made was this. Oh God, I should send you my demo. It's horrible. But it got me on TV. I always say you only need one person to believe in you. You only need mm -hmm. one wife, one husband, one person to believe in you. You know, one wife, one husband, unless you live in Utah, and then all bets are off. They do whatever they want right. with wives and husbands there. <laughs> but a guy named Alberto Pando, the VP of programming at the station, called me and he went, I like your style. We'd love to put you on the air. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but I ended up on the air in May of 2002 doing a cooking segment twice a week. And 15 Emmys later. Yeah, 15 Emmys later. So right. it wins Emmys for this 90-second stuff. Then it becomes a half-hour show, and it wins more Emmys. Discovery Health came along. I had a series there called Just Cook This until they sold the channel to Oprah, who I'm not too mad at, even though they didn't think that I could be part of that channel. Live your best life. Apparently, I didn't help anybody live their best life. Or I was too <laughs> manly or too much testosterone in my recipes, whatever it was. So I didn't get that. And then another channel had me. And about seven years ago, my oldest child said, I think you should be on YouTube. It's becoming mm -hmm. a real thing. And mm -hmm. I want to be mm -hmm. part of it. I want to shoot it. I want to edit it. And he had no experience at all. And how could I look at him and go, you have no right to be in this business when I had right. no right to yeah. be in the business. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. it's really about following what you love to do. What matters? And I think we all, the older you get, you realize how important this concept is. Really what matters is that you do what you love. Because on your last mm -hmm. day on this planet, you're not going to remember the money, the cars, any of that BS. You're going to remember what's in your heart. And I don't want to get sappy, but I truly, firmly believe that. you got to do what you love because if you do it well, you'll succeed at it. It's that simple, but you'll also enjoy it. You know that book, Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow? I think they mm -hmm. should yes, rename it to Do What You Love. You'll be immensely effing happy. And if the money follows... It's a bonus. Well, and you talk about that often in your different videos. There's one in particular I'm thinking about, yeah. about how you caution people that you don't just jump in doing it well, kind of like what you just explained. Yeah. Right? It's your first video, but it's you watching your first video. In fact, I think you call it me watching my first cringy <laughs> video. Cringeworthy, and you're exactly. you're critiquing yourself, yeah, right? Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I think we've all had that moment, right? We hear or see ourselves and we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. What was great about that video is some of the stuff you're saying now about you just got to believe in yourself or just have that one person who That's believes you in you and give yeah. yourself permission. Yeah. I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. My third cookbook I wrote in the, the beginning, cooking is like riding a bike. The more you do it, the better you get. The reality is everything is like riding a bike. 
Nobody could ride a bike in the beginning. Absolutely. And now look, everybody yeah. can. And the only difference between not riding a bike and riding a bike is this little thing called practice and experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. An accountant is nowhere near as good his first day as he is his 500th and first day. A doctor's bedside manner improves the more experience they have. You know, it, we all just get better. So you just got to give it a little bit. You go to make a pineapple upside down cake, something I've never made, and I don't know why I use this example, but you make it once, it's way too sweet, it's way too burnt, it's dry, it's awful. And just because some celebrity chef in a cookbook or on YouTube or TV says, do it this way, doesn't necessarily mean that all the details are gonna work out for you. Their oven may be absolutely perfectly calibrated. When they dial 350, it's exactly 350. I imagine if you uh, ask a thousand people what their oven was really at, they wouldn't have any idea. And 350 could very well be 450 or three and a quarter, 300. Maybe mm -hmm. one cup of sugar is too much for your taste. But the second time you go to make that pineapple upside down cake, now the experience kicks in. Too much sugar, I'm gonna back it off. Too long in the oven, I'm gonna back it off. Not enough time, I'm gonna increase it. It changes, you just get better. And I got better as I went. The difference between that original video, Renee, and eight months later is I finally found my voice. Mm -hmm. I was trying to be like what everybody else who cooked right. on TV did. Yep. And you know, I finally yeah. came to the realization, the world didn't need another Bobby Flay, another Emeril, another whoever came before me. Just by being myself, that should have been enough, but I didn't get it in the beginning. And now I know. My grandmother's expression is this. That's why they make different flavors of ice cream. I get not everybody's gonna mm -hmm. like me, but it's a lot easier being me than trying to be me as a cook that I have watched and I'm gonna mimic. Absolutely. And one of the things that I love about watching your videos and listening to a lot of the podcasts that you're yeah. on is that you are fabulously and also famously neurotic. Ugh. That's the great thing about it. You well, are. No, you talk it's about- It's endearing. It oh, is, because you. you talk about, look, feeling inferior, feeling less than, feeling yes. competitive, feeling yes, jealous yes, and envious. Yes. I mean, there was one show that I listened and I was very touched. You talked about your brother's suicide, mm. you know? And I think, mm. I think that people tune in to see the cooking, absolutely. But mm. there's a real guy behind that. And I think mm. what you see is what you get. Uh, look, my wife would tell you, Kelly would say, uh, David, Renee, and Adam, if you like Sam on YouTube, you'll like him off mm -hmm. YouTube because he's the same guy. That being said, mm -hmm. if you hate his guts on YouTube, <laughs> you'll hate his guts <laughs> off YouTube because he's the same guy. And it, it occurred to me at some point, it was easier just to be me than try and be somebody else. Like, yeah. uh, I don't like to lie because I'm not bright enough to remember all of the uh, made up stuff. And I don't wanna have to go, when somebody goes, hey, where were you Tuesday night? I don't wanna have to go, oh crap. What did I tell them? Did I say I was at home? Did I say that I was sick? Yeah, you know, yeah. what, by the way, I'll never use a sick excuse. I just think that's like the world's worst karma, always. But yeah. come back and bite you in the ass. You know, I met a guy um, years ago that uh, was in the knife business and, and had knives in all the very famous people's hands. And he, he said to me one day, he goes, well, you really are the same. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, like the, the celebrity chefs you see on TV, he goes, there's a very definite on-screen persona and then off, there's something mm -hmm. else. He goes, you're the same guy. Yeah. And I joke, I'm not bright enough to remember the difference, but it just feels right, you know? It's a huge compliment. Mm -hmm. My TV show in the very beginning, if a producer or a, a camera person's phone went off as I was shooting, I would call them out for it. And we would leave that in the shot. And people, there's this fourth, there's this fourth wall, you know, you never address anything on the other side of the camera. Well, it didn't make sense to me. If I'm shooting and somebody's phone goes off who's just watching, I'm gonna say something to them. So you either like me or you don't. And I feel very warm and hugged by you guys right now. <laughs> well, to the point where you give people permission to be themselves, right? Yeah, and to not yeah. get it right. That's what you do for others. Yeah when you show who you truly are. In that same video I was referring to earlier, you kept in the part where you're looking in the dishwasher, you're 
rifling through your drawer for your whisk. And you're like, no, I don't want to cut this from the clip. Yeah. Because that's how it really happens in the, life. The guy that shot that said, all right, let's just stop the camera, put it down, you find your whisk, and we'll pick it up as if you had it. And I said, but that somehow that just, it doesn't, it, what feels real is not knowing what your stuff is. You know, I know that Absolutely. happens to people. And I got the comment back from one of the people that I sent it to for an opinion. He goes, look, you have to be looked at as you're the expert, you know everything. And I go, but people no. don't know everything. Exactly. I remember hearing that Rachel Ray cut herself in one of her very first uh, times on camera. They stopped the camera, they backed yeah. it up, they crazy glued it, they put makeup on the, the cut and they continued like it didn't happen. I can't tell you how many times I've cut or burned myself on camera, left it in, dropped things. And to your point, Renee, people come up to me now and they go, you make me feel like it's okay to make mistakes. I go, but it always was okay. The problem is you're yeah. watching like this perfectionist uh, version of what cooking should be in those worlds. Exactly. I remember saying once on camera in the very beginning, blah, 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 make sure you use a really good olive oil, right? We finish that segment, cameras go off. I start getting ready for the next one. And one of the camera people said, what do you mean by a really good olive oil? And I went, oh crap, I don't know. I just heard Martha Stewart say that. I don't know what that meant. Right. Now I know and I know not to say things like that. Or if I do, explain why you would want a good olive oil, and why you wouldn't want this. And I don't watch very much cooking, but when I do and I hear somebody say something, cut against the grain and they don't explain why you should cut against the grain with a steak or something. Oh, I just go nuts. I go, come on, give people more information yeah. than you're giving. Exactly. Because then they do the exact opposite of what they're professing to do, right? Yeah. Is they're making yeah. people feel more inadequate. People already have enough of that. So let's talk about Sam, the cooking guy recipes yeah. with intentional leftovers, right? Your latest book. Yeah. Why did you decide to write about leftovers? In my opinion, people have very strong feelings about them. Uh, they do. Uh, I think a lot of people feel leftovers are the best part of the meal sometimes. Mm -hmm. The next day, mm -hmm. this, that, whatever it is you're making. And, you know, because I didn't come from a culinary background, because I didn't go to culinary school or, I mean, now I have uh, restaurants, but I'm not really on the line cooking all that often. I, I didn't grow up studying really everything you can do with food. And maybe a chef comes out of, you know, the Culinary Institute of America and really knows everything to do with a leftover piece of fat or steak or chicken or whatever. But mm -hmm. it was not really until a couple of years ago that my thinking changed. And before that, I'd be make this chicken, have it as chicken, have it as chicken the next day, and then be like, okay, I'm okay, I'm sick of chicken now. And then it would sit in the fridge mm -hmm. another two yeah. days and then I'd throw it out. And so I think in the beginning yeah. of the book, I go, we throw uh, yes. 35 million pounds of food, uh, you know, a day in this country. Every day. Yes. Which yeah, by the way is- I didn't think or I bought which, it. Which by the way, thank yeah. you, is complete BS. I just made that yeah. number up. And you know, I've had so many totally people who, who've read that and then stopped reading apparently and went, wow, that statistic is amazing. I go, yes, well, it's also <laughs> BS because I made it up. <laughs> but, but we do. And so a couple of years ago, I started saying, you know, well, maybe that little piece of chicken could be something else. Maybe this leftover steak or that one slice of cold pizza could become something. And that started the thinking. And it really sort of kicked in in the past uh, year and a half, uh, two years. And when Michael Tizano from Countryman came and said, I've been watching you, I'm a fan. Would you be interested in writing a book? I would. And he goes, any thoughts about what that might be? And I go, 100% thoughts. I've got it basically almost written in my computer. He goes, what do you mean? I go, I told him what the idea was. And he goes, well, I like that. I think that could be something. My original title was Make This, Then That. Then that, which, mm -hmm. right? Which I, is, yep. which is um, a, a bit of a rip from- a great title. Men's Health Magazine. Mm -hmm. Eat this, not that. Not that. So right. I think they yep. thought it was a little close, but the best advice I got on not using that title was it said nothing about food. Make this, yeah. then that. Mm. Could be make this sweater by knitting 
and then turn it into, uh, you know, things to put on your counter so you don't yeah. burn the counter when you put a hot pot down. What I find is fascinating is that I was saying to Renee earlier in the show that it's not so much intentional leftovers. I think of it as intentional makeovers. Oh, that's a good, okay. You're thank you some, for ruining my title I and know. now making me want to read I know. the second version <laughs> Sam, of this book. you didn't call you didn't call me and I didn't know They're you. Makeovers. Now I that's will. That's so great. <laughs> well, but that doesn't say food either. So <laughs> that's true. So good. Yeah. Thanks, Renee. Good. It's a terrible idea, David. Stop it. Yeah. So it just started coming together. I like to make things and I like to make them last longer. And I think they get a new life and sometimes they get a better life. Thanksgiving is great. Thanksgiving the next day is great. Stuffing the next day is great. But repurposing into something else. I've already said I don't like cold pizza. I don't like cold pizza. I don't know how people can eat cold pizza. But hey, make a great pizza or buy a couple great pizzas and then turn it into other things. There's a, there's a lasagna made out of leftover pizza. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to add a couple things to it, but it comes out amazing. Do you guys have a copy of the book there? Yeah, of course we do. Okay, We're good. looking at them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you, man? Sorry, We're I don't know. Look, I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm in San Diego. I don't know. I'm in a different time zone. Who knows? Well, Who knows what's wrong with me? Being Canadian explains the leftover brisket on fries with cheese sauce. Oh, That's doesn't a nice it? Riff. Yeah, um, thank yeah. you. Yeah. But for the listeners, explain how you take meatballs. Yes. And then what you do with it. So they understand the concept that they're not thinking they're having meatballs four days in a row. So it, it occurred to me one day, well, can I use meatloaf as an example? Because that was one of the, the first things that I did. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you make meatloaf. Uh, what, look, one of the greatest foods ever. And I know a lot of people are off of it. They don't like it. And I think that's just because they grew up with crappy meatloaf. Yep. Sure. So I think my meatloaf is a great meatloaf. And by the way, we shot it once for the book. And then uh, I looked at the photos and I went, wow, something's really missing. I know it's missing a little color. And I, I'm famous for using green onions or parsley on top of food. I really think you should finish the food. It should look finished. It should look nice. And green onions chopped or parsley is not a complicated thing to do. I'm not doing fancy chef tricks, right? This is something anybody can do. But so I ended up putting spinach in the middle of this meatloaf. And oh my God. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different thing. It's completely, it's gorgeous. It's maybe one of the most beautiful meatloaves I've ever seen in my life. But so it occurred to me one day, as I'm looking at a leftover big fat slice of meatloaf, what could that become? And it became a meat sauce for me. I had in my mm. pantry, which is also in the book, uh, not my pantry, my fridge, some leftover roasted red pepper sauce that I make that I think right. is one of the greatest things ever that you can make literally with a jar of roasted red peppers and a little broth and some seasoning and you're there and you put it in a blender and you're done. But so I looked at this meatloaf and I went, wait a minute, if I was going to make a meat sauce to go on some pasta, I would take ground beef. I would put it in the pan. I would start to cook it. I would add seasonings. Yeah. I would mix it all together. Then I would add like the tomato or the roasted red pepper component. I went, wait a minute, the first 80% of it's already done. So I took nice. that meatloaf, I heated a pan, I put a little, you know, uh, avocado oil in it, crumbled it up, got yeah. it hot, then threw the roasted red pepper sauce in. I was like, holy crap, this is literally now like a two-ingredient recipe. The greatest thing yeah. ever. And so, look, uh, the meatloaf is great like that. We make meatloaf sloppy joes out of it. Mm. And then, of course, yeah. there's the, the classic and you have to make it a meatloaf sandwich with you melty cheese on top of it. And the sauce that is yep. in the book is this thing that's this mayo and, and chipotle chilies and ketchup and apricot jam that just glazes it beautifully, but, but works it out so nicely. But the meatballs that you spoke of, we turn into a meatball pho. And why can't you? Yeah. Beef broth, you know, some noodles, a, a few things. You go from nothing to everything in about five minutes. The line I've used for years is big in taste and small in effort. I yeah. want to eat well. I don't want it to take forever. You know, we all have a choice. You know, you talk to friends and you go, okay, look, I'm going to be home from work at five o'clock. Uh, let me get ready. I'll start to cook. I'll do everything. Blah, blah, blah. You guys come over at seven. And they come over and everything's done. I would rather this be the scenario, which it is in my house. I'm going to be home at five o'clock. Just let me get out of my clothes, go to the bathroom, wash my hands. You come over at 520. Now we make everything together. 
and the stuff's going to be easy. If shrimp have to be grilled, Alan, you get to grill a shrimp. Susan, you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Somebody's on cocktails. Time with friends and family is so short these days. Everybody's so busy. Giving yourself less time because you want to lay out some chefy kind of fancy thing with roulade. I don't know. I can't even think of the words. But it makes me crazy. People say to me, like colleagues, people I know, hey, we should get together for dinner sometime. And I'm now, because I'm old enough and I'm confident enough, say to them, I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm just going to be honest. It's probably not going to happen. <laughs> right. The closest people in my life, I just honestly don't have time for. And it's not that I don't want to have time for you. I do. But I need to spend time with the ones I really love and I really have to see. Yeah. I respect that. Yeah. So we should learn that line. It's tough, but but it back to is. David's meatballs, right? We turn yep. it into um, into a bon me, which yep. they're already meatballs. A meatball mm -hmm. bon me, come on. You know, some mayo and the seasonings and stuff like that, you're there. I use it for a Greek salad, a big meatball Greek salad, which is great. One of the yep. things that we serve at my restaurant, Gray's, I live in Little Italy, the restaurant's in Little Italy here in San Diego, which by the way, little known fact, largest Little Italy in the country. I know both of hmm. you will crap on that. And you, no, New York or Philadelphia. <laughs> no, 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 San Diego, the, 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 the left coast. It's not possible to have that. How am I supposed to trust you when you said that we waste 35 million pounds? Of <laughs> well, I did admit that that was, I did admit that was a you lie. Did. You <laughs> did admit did. Your, it was a lie. But so yes. All this, right. we call this, we call this, I name this polpetto de mano, which very strictly <laughs> translated means hand meatball. Okay. So you take puff pastry, you know, in a in like a muffin cup, and you put some cheese and sauce in the bottom, and the meatball, yeah. and more stuff on top, and you bake it, and it's they it's wonderful. Great. Yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. So there's that, and the other thing I do uh, is you cut them in half, you mix them with pesto, they go on like a flat bread, and you make like this great, delicious, cheesy pesto meatball flat bread. It's it's just don't eat the same thing the same way all the time. I just mm -hmm. want to shake people. And that's the reason why I don't like leftovers. I'll eat the same damn thing for four days in a row, and I get tired of it, and I throw it away. But it's so easy to change it up, David. But it's, I don't think of it, you know? Well, you need to start. There's, a, there's another step beyond the people that eat the chicken the same way for three or four days. Mm -hmm. It's the people that do this. Well, if it's Tuesday, it's the day we make Aunt Ruth's chicken. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Wednesday is this, Thursday is that, Sunday night is always this. I'm like, just stop that nonsense right now. Or yeah. if you must, if you're going to the store to buy the ingredients for Aunt Ruth's chicken, I don't know what the ingredients are. We'll just say raspberry jam, chicken, panko breadcrumbs, you know, green onions and uh, yogurt, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. Which by the way, would be a terrible combination. Nobody do that, I just made that up. <laughs> I say this. Pretend one of the ingredients no longer exists or you mm. can't buy it. Some mm -hmm. of the best things I've made when, when I've been forced to punt and, oh, nice. crap, I can't get that? What am I going to do now? Find something mm -hmm. else. Barbecue sauce. Oh, I thought I had it. And I go to make, I need to make this. Well, guess what? Hoisin is always in my pantry. It's mm -hmm. always in my fridge. Hoisin is a beautiful stand-in. I call it Chinese barbecue sauce. And really, I guess it, it kind of is. But you mm -hmm. just need to change up your thinking. Yeah. If the thinking doesn't change, the food doesn't change, and what you eat doesn't change, and now you're just in a food rut. Yeah. Well, it's just like you mentioned earlier. When you started to change how you looked at your next job, yeah. then your world changed. Yeah, you're right. Everything changed. All right, hey, actually, I've got a question here for you, Sam. Yeah. What's the craziest thing that you've come up with recipe-wise that just didn't quite make it into the book? Wow, that's a good question. There was a moment in time when I was going to have one of the, so there's 19 chapters in the book, each with like a master recipe, apart from the right. Thanksgiving one, where we're not showing you how to make anything, but what to do with the leftovers. There was a moment in time I was going to do a chapter on cheeseburgers. We have a burger restaurant. I think I've got an amazing cheeseburger. And I thought, how fun to, to take that. It just did not pencil out. We have a recipe for you. There, yeah, go ahead. Cheeseburger Thanksgiving stuffing. 
Okay, I was just gonna say that's the only thing. The, the only, only thing, thing I can come up with because <laughs> there's a something. there's the white castle, <sighs> white castle stuffing. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. That was the I go. A chapter with how to make a cheeseburger and then one recipe <laughs> wasn't gonna cut it. <laughs> do, you, do you guys remember like what was it called? Hamburger helper? There was like a cheese hamburger, yes. helper. hamburger helper. That's probably not something everybody really wants every night, but just thinking, there was a cheeseburger flavored hamburger helper. I'm remembering this from the eighties now. Do do they <laughs> yes. still make that? They do. Oh. You're welcome, David and Renee. I get to bring up Hamburger Helper on your show. So wrong. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. You know what? Maybe it's something that needs to be tasted again, Renee, before you say so wrong. Who knows? See, it's the taste of my childhood. So I, I don't care how bad it is. Yeah. My husband, he loves Velveeta. I can't break him with a Velveeta hat. Oh. He loves no. it. No. And by the way, you should just yeah. leave him the hell alone. Velveeta <laughs> has an absolute place in our society. It really does. He thinks I'll so talk too. to him sometime. <laughs> Give him some ideas. Okay. It's fine. So this is going to lead into what we want to call Sam the Cooking Guy Leftover Challenge. We're going to oh, name God. three really? ingredients. Yes. Yeah. Three Damn disparate it. ingredients, and we want to know what you can make out of it. Okay. All right? Wait, all three in the same dish or three separate dishes? No, maybe three in the same dish. What was the intention? The intention was to basically screw with me. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Now I'm on. The I'm on now the uh, elite's culinary uh, version of chopped. Exactly. But you get to do it your way, yes. Sam. So the first one would be spaghetti carbonara, chicken liver pate, and roasted broccoli. What can you do with that? Oh, for God's sakes! I know. <laughs> I'm God, what was the what was the second one? What kind of pate? Chicken liver. Well, look, I'm Jewish. I right. think I make maybe the best chopped liver. Are you a chopped liver fan, anybody? I love chopped liver. I, I'm the biggest you want to be you'll find. Biggest. Well, turns out we're taking applications this week, David. <laughs> well, there you go. If you'd, like so to, if you'd like to join the team, be happy to send you the paperwork. <laughs> Great. End of, end, of the year, end of the year sale. Okay. Carbonara, <laughs> uh, chicken liver pate, and... Roasted broccoli. <sighs> okay. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to mm -hmm. repurpose the carbonara much like it is. Mm -hmm. It does have a protein in it. There's bacon or pancetta or something like that. Pancetta. But we're right. going to use the pate in that as well. Okay. We're going to let it be a little sauce. So while the carbonara is doing its thing, just being rewarmed, rethermed, as we say, I'm going to mm -hmm. take the pate and I'm going to put it in a pan. I'm going to start to warm it up. And as it starts to break down, I'm going to add some whipping cream to it, some heavy cream. Okay. Not too mm -hmm. much. And I'm going to mix it. And it's going to go from being this chunky pate, a slice, whatever a, whatever nonsense piece you gave me to work this up. This now will now become a cream sauce, uh -huh. a liver pate cream sauce, which, by the way, I think would be really delicious. It's up my alley. Well, maybe a little extra seasoning to it, perhaps a touch of red pepper flake. So the mm -hmm. pasta is being rethermed. I've got this cream sauce going on here. And now we're going to take the roasted broccoli. We're going to chop it up. And now I'm going to throw it into a very hot oven because I want to make these smaller pieces of it crispy because they're going to become the garnish for this horrendous mess that you forced me <laughs> to put together on a plate. If I had a bell, I'd ring it. <laughs> the carbonara is now warm. The leftover chicken pate cream sauce is now folded into this. Mm -hmm. And it's plated beautifully using that gorgeous chef technique of that long fork that you would carve a turkey with, which, by the way, I've never owned one. I've owned one, but I've never jam that into a turkey or a roast beef to use. I just somehow use my hand. <laughs> and I'm going to wind the pasta around that. I'm going to put it on a plate looking as beautiful as I can muster. Mm -hmm. And then scattered over the top of it will be mm -hmm. these crispy bits of broccoli, you say. Just nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> and then nutty just bro. to finish, it, I'm going to add one more thing. I'm going to take some panko breadcrumbs while this is all happening, melt some butter, combine the two in a little pan, let them get crispy, and that will be sprinkled over the top. All right. All right. And I don't Bravo. know who's going to eat that. Thank you. Thank you. You can see how amused David is. Yes. <laughs> well, Sam, it has been so great talking to you, and we need to have you back because this has been a great Great episode. No, definitely. Thank you. I was just thinking, could I just call you guys on 
random off times in chat because you're so fun. And the food, I, look, I love talking food all the time. And people come up and they'll ask me a question. I go, sorry, I don't want to bug you with this, but. And I go, look, you're yeah. not bugging me because yeah. I, it's my world. It's what I do. I love talking mm -hmm. food. And especially when it gets people to the point where they get some inspiration. And look, yes. not to do, make it all about the book, but if you get anything out of the book, forget the recipes. Even if you just look at a friends of yours copy, if you walk away mm -hmm. going, well, holy crap, that gave me some ideas about what I can do. You know, when I first started talking about this, there's a chapter on how to nail a perfect steak. A gorgeous mm -hmm. every time. Mm -hmm. Reverse sear, I know you guys know it. It's an important technique. It's very simple. It lets you get a steak exactly where you want it without the gray around the outside and a slight little bit of medium rare in the middle. This gives you medium rare, top to bottom, end to end, and wall to wall. But people would say to me, no, I, I appreciate what you're doing, but I never have leftover steak. And I go, I want to say, listen, idiot. Make more. You don't have right. to have leftover steak. Cook once, but eat a bunch of times. If you're going to go out to the grill, and you know, God knows what your temperature is right now, stand there in 20 degree weather and cook one steak, yeah. why not cook two steaks or two chicken breasts or make a couple extra meatballs and put them in your freezer and then bring them out a week from now, a month from now. Cook once, eat a bunch of times. It's that simple. So if the only thing people get from this book is some inspiration, I mean, come on, that makes me very happy. Nice, intentional cooking indeed. Sam Zion is a leading cookbook personality, restaurateur and author with 15 Emmys for his regional TV show, four cookbooks, 12 Today Show appearances, two restaurants in San Diego, and now over 2.4 million YouTube subscribers. And yes, I wonder why I feel inadequate at the moment. <laughs> This podcast is produced by Overt Studios, and our producer is Adam, the audio guy, Claremont. You can reach Adam and Overt Studios at overtstudios.com. And remember to subscribe to Talking With My Mouthful wherever you download your favorite podcasts. And if you like what you hear and want to support us, consider leaving a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to leave Renee and me a recorded question or compliment, visit our podcast page at leit.es slash chat. Press and talk away and maybe you'll be featured on the show. Ciao. Ciao.